Very good afternoon to everybody. It looks like uh, we have very few participants today due to the island-wide power cut. So I'm not sure how many of them are not able to get in. I'm, I'm also just uh, using my data now to continue with the session. So we will, we will just continue as per the schedule. And um, in case you get cut off halfway or you're not able to stay through, no worries. This session uh, will, will be recorded. I'm aware there is no power uh, everywhere. So I was lucky that my laptop was fully charged and, uh, and uh, I'm able to use my data for this session. So we will not waste much time. So we will continue with the session. Um, the session will be recorded, so no worries uh, for those who are, who's going to be missing the session. I will make sure that all of them get access to the file, the presentation file, and also the recording. Okay. So today we are going to be looking at uh, another important uh, subject area in our session uh, uh, last week. We were introduced to the Institutional Review Board, IRB. Today, moving on from that session, we are going to look at uh, tweaking your quantitative research design during unfortunate events or crisis. And I feel this is an important topic because this is a state that we are in currently, and this may be the state that we may be in many times uh, in the future as well. So I think it is critical for us to actually understand how do we manage the situation during a period of crisis. So before I begin, let me baseline what I'm speaking uh, for the next uh, 30 minutes or so before we open for discussion. Firstly, remember this is not a quantitative research methodology webinar. Okay, We will not be discussing the fundamentals of how to carry out a research uh, using a quantitative approach, but this uh, discussion is merely to discuss the best quantitative research approach during unfortunate events or crisis. So as a researcher, I'm sure you have been all well exposed to the fundamentals of a research method. So my focus today is simple. How do you carry out uh, a reliable quantitative research method in unfortunate circumstances like uh, now, like how we are in now? So why is this session important? Because we may be in this kind of crisis uh, more often than you think. Okay, so as a researcher, both for students, faculty or staff, uh, this crisis is not an excuse to not able to, not being able to carry out uh, reliable research for your studies and eventually for your publication. So this is what I'm going to be covering for the next uh, few minutes. Okay, conducting research survey during unfortunate events or crisis. Oh, how are you? Oh, I think uh, someone's mic is on. Okay. Um, all right, so what I'm going to be covering for the next few minutes is looking at uh, uh, the whole concept of conducting research during crisis period. What are the guiding principles that you need to be well versed of? And if you talk about carrying out quantitative research, uh, the best approach, of course, is using the online survey or web-based survey. So we're going to be drilling down a bit more on that. How do you manage your uh, sampling during uh, when you carry out online survey? What sort of collaborative tools that you're going to be looking at? And what are uh, some of the important code of ethics when you talk about conducting research uh, during a crisis uh, period? So before we decide to carry out a quantitative research approach uh, for study uh, during the period when you are in crisis, it is always important for us to understand what do you mean by this unfortunate event or crisis. So crisis is a state that exists uh, when a person, so when I say a person, it can be an organization, it can be a country, it can be a region, or even the world as what we see now, 
is thrown completely uh, off balance uh, emotionally by an unexpected and potentially harmful event or difficult development transition. It can be being thrown off economically or environmentally. Like in, in our case, we have to always deal with the issue of hurricanes. So that can become a crisis as well. Outbreak of disease, health epidemic, or even the current pandemic that we see. Hence, uh, understandably, when you are in a state of crisis, there will be a feeling of loss of control and power over yourself and the cause of your life for your life for a period of time. So this will certainly result in disequilibrium, disorientation and disruption. It is uh, the intense emotional experience of this state that will create the crisis. So you need to understand this state of mind of the respondents before you engage in any form of quantitative or qualitative uh, research. So research is vital to accurately describe uh, the state of a crisis and to evaluate the effectiveness and uh, appropriateness of intervention. Although the ethical principle of uh, justice uh, or goodness and respect for, for persons should be upheld in any research, whether it's crisis or not crisis, the situation when you are in crisis becomes a bit more critical. Just like in any non-emergency situation, research in emergency situation or during the period of uh, crisis should be conducted in the best interest of the victim who may be your respondents. So the research should not unnecessarily expose human subjects um, and the researcher to careless harm and should be adequate with scientific rigor. Okay. So victims of uh, emergency situations are vulnerable population that need special protection from exploitation. So there comes the, uh, the major role that uh, an institutional review board IRB plays as well during this crisis period. So how do you navigate yourself uh, in decision making during crisis when you're conducting quantitative research study? If you look at the crisis uh, that we are all in today, Everything is up in the air as COVID-19 has uh, placed a pause on life for, uh, for many of us, both individually and business and organization. There are a lot of uncertainty about the uh, future and the impact the pandemic will have on our life. So how do we continue to learn and understand uh, consumers if you're doing a research in this trying time? Because these consumers are the respondents that I'm speaking about in the context of the research here. So looking at the current pandemic, we may be in a new norm for a longer period than predicted uh, before. So stopping research for months on end until the pandemic is over does not seem like a practical good option, especially in the changing landscape that we are in. Therefore, the key question here is, uh, is not if, but how to obtain a reliable insight quantitatively in a time of crisis. In addition to adjusting your current approach, there are new approaches of research uh, that could prove useful in the coming period. Hence, uh, what is important is for you to devise the right way to analyze data during the crisis, not just this crisis, but uh, it can be any crisis for that matter. And, we, and believe me, you are going to be living in this new world with full of crisis and you need to be prepared for it. The two fundamental guiding principle solution that uh, you can use uh, to help you navigate your decision making, which I will, I will discuss a bit more detail. First one is conduct various scenario analysis based on the different sentiments. And the second one is to use working assumption during the, the period of the turbulence and modify them accordingly. So let's look at the first one. So if you look at the first one using the scenario analysis and split, during any undesirable uh, events or crisis, the sentiments of the respondents that is being analyzed uh, in, a, in a quantitative research survey is critical in how they respond to the survey and hence the validity of the finding. So if your respondent is not in a good state of mind, the findings may be invalid. So generally these sentiments can be grouped into three groups, very worried, concerned, or little or not worried or it can be grouped to any more suitable grouping uh, based on the sentiments uh, of the crisis. So by segmenting this respondent based on different sentiments, as a researcher, we are able to analyze each group separately and make more valid and generalizable uh, a conclusion for each group accordingly. 
So the qualifying question at the beginning of any survey can include this sentiment question, which can uh, then be used to analyze the findings based on this group. So when you carry out a study like this, obviously the, the number of sampling that you need is much higher. You need to over recruit your respondents because you're trying to split them up based on this sentiment. So I'll give you an example here. So if you look at this table that I've put on the screen, a survey is carried out uh, to make a conclusion of a new tourism marketing design post COVID-19 for a destination. Based on all the items uh, in the survey for scenario one, if you see, the three groups of people with three with uh, different sentiments, the group A, the group B and C, with very worried, worried and mostly not worried respectively, will indicate uh, indicated to select design one for all the three groups. So this is quite clear. So because no matter what is the sentiment, everyone have actually concluded to launch design one. So it's quite clear. But if you look at scenario two and three, it's slightly different. In scenario two, design one is selected, but to monitor further, why? Because uh, the selection is not overwhelming, especially from group A who are very worried. They are already in that worried state of mind and you're asking them their opinion. So obviously their reasoning may not be as accurate or as how it should be. And if you look at scenario three, it's even worse. Three of them with three different state of mind have actually given three different findings. So meaning to say, you, you got to rethink on the design. It doesn't work. So this scenario analysis, when you use for your survey, it will allow you to structure the, the findings based on the current state of your respondents. So this is important. The second approach is using this uh, uh, monitoring using a period of time. If you have the luxury of time, of course, you are able to do this, doing carrying out a longitudinal study. Um, this approach can be conducted uh, to, to check out your hypothesis itself, whether it fits during the period of crisis versus before the crisis, during the crisis, and even after the crisis. So the best decision uh, you can make at the moment is with the info you have because you are now at the current state. Let's say if you do a study during the period of pandemic now, the result may be different from what it was before the pandemic and what is going to be after the pandemic. So you may need to do a, a, a comparison during these phases. If all the three phases shows almost similar finding, then you can make a more sound decision that is coming out from the study. So what will be the best uh, quantitative research method approach during unfortunate event? Remember what we have discussed uh, uh, so far is uh, Researchers, when they are working on any crisis situation, they have to always take into consideration of the respondent. So when you're trying to look at the respondents, there are, there are tools that you can actually use to actually carry out this study. And of course, the most common uh, survey instrument that all of us will be using during this period is the online or web-based survey. So online survey or best sur uh, survey, uh, surveys that is questionnaire survey that can be completed over the internet. Okay, so you can be using any tools, any gadget that is able to read the internet. But if you're using a, a, a device, okay, an online device, but uh, let's say you're using a tablet, but then you do a face-to-face -face, uh, 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 administered in, uh, interview, then that is not regarded as a, as a um, uh, as an online uh, or web-based survey. It is an online or web-based survey, but it is not a face-to-face -face survey. So in a crisis situation, you, the tendency is we need to find ways to carry out this study, not face-to-face. -face. And then the current pandemic that we are in, we are in, it's even worse. You do not want to be face-to-face -face with the respondent. So if you look at the online survey, the internet now provides a, uh, easy access to many inexpensive survey software, as well as to uh, millions of potential survey respondents. It has in fact uh, lowered the cost for you to actually carry out these surveys. While this is good news uh, for survey researchers, these same factors have also facilitated uh, uh, proliferation of bad survey research practice. There are more badly designed online survey than a good one. Even during normal circumstances, you would have experienced uh, seeing badly designed uh, online surveys. During the period of crisis, 
badly designed questionnaires, if useless, is useless uh, if the findings cannot be a good representation of the actual sentiment of the respondent. So this is very critical. So if you look at some of the common one, I'm sure you have used many of these uh, application and you're free to try out any of these application that you think is, that fits to your requirement. Of course, the most common one that all of us have used is the, the Survey Monkey and the Google Forms. But then in addition to these two, there are other applications that you can try out. So typically when you carry out uh, any of this web-based survey, uh, uh, there are four steps that you will actually look at. Step one is uh, designing and developing uh, the web-based survey itself. Basically, you carry out the proper literature review and decide on the indicators to measure, design it accordingly uh, offline first, and then you put it on online. Step two of hosting and data collection. So you will basically look at the, select the suitable application that can host the survey and then and send the information out to the respondents. So. So this is another mechanism that is important because the way how you collect the data is critical. Garbage in, garbage out. So if the data is collected poorly, then the finding can be useless. Step three, data response and data coding sheet. So monitor the data collection process. Is there any issue in the response rate? And ensure data can be coded accordingly. If other applications are used to analyze, like if you're using SPSS or SAS, can you actually uh, uh, ensure that this data can be read or can be converted or exported uh, into this application. And then lastly, uh, step four is the analysis, data analysis and the graphical representation of the data. This uh, final step is to carry out the actual analysis and do the visualization. Okay, so this is important. What is the most suitable visualization for the data that you are looking at? So one of the most uh, common challenge that you will always experience in carrying out a quantitative survey during period of crisis is the response rate. <laughs> a survey with a weak response rate is useless for any analysis as the finding uh, may not be well represented and generalized. The response rate can go up and down depending on the technological variation, okay? Just like what we are facing now, all of a sudden we have a power cut and the number of people uh, locked in for the session today have totally dropped. So this is something that can impact even in a survey. Computer literacy, look at your respondent. Are they literate enough as far as using your gadgets to, to answer the question? The inter internet penetration rate again, are they, uh, do they have access to the network? Low response rate, okay, for whatever reason, the response rate low, so how do you tackle the response rate? privacy and security issues, okay? People are skeptical sometimes of this online survey. Is it really private? Is it really confidential? So you got to prove to them that everything is good. And then of course, the sample selection. How do you manage the sampling effectively? Because if your sampling is done poorly, everybody can become your sample and, and everybody can be, can be part of your respondent and the findings may be skewed to the wrong way that, that you don't want it to. So there are 10 tips to build a great uh, online survey, especially during the period of crisis. Okay, how do we do that? Firstly, defining the purpose uh, clearly. Clearly define what you're trying to measure. Okay, when you have a very fuzzy goals, uh, it is going to, re at the end of the day, it will result in, in, in fuzzy uh, result as well. So the last thing you want to end up is you are having too many questions and the question is really not addressing what you actually want to, okay? So be clear, why are you creating the survey? What do you hope to accomplish from this survey? How will you use the data you are collecting? And what decision do you hope to impact with the result of the survey? So this is important because this will later help you identify what data you need to collect in order to make this decision. Keep the survey precise and focused. Remember, you are carrying out the survey in a crisis situation. The last thing that you want is your survey is, is not focused and you are putting off the respondents because they are already in a crisis situation in the first place. So, so short and focused survey helps with both quality and quantity of the response. It is generally better to focus on a single objective than trying to create a master survey that covers uh, a multiple objectives. 
And at the end of the day, you have a situation what we what we 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 call the survey fatigue. It's too long, too much. People are not responding ac accordingly. The worst thing that you want is they they have responded, but they have not responded the question accurately because it's fatigue. After a, while, a point, they just take as they wish. That is even worse worse than people who do not take because. They have answered all the questions, but their responses is invalid. So that, that becomes a, a problem. Keep the question simple. Make sure your questions get to the point and avoid the use of jargon. So make sure it is accurate enough. Try to be specific. Okay. Avoid uh, uh, leading questions. Okay. Or loaded questions. Okay. Leading question is basically you're guiding the respondents to answer a certain way, which is which should be avoided. You don't want to create any biasness. Okay, and then there's also loaded question. Loaded question is you make an assumption uh, uh, about the respondent that that uh, that they are familiar with certain thing that you're asking, which they may not be familiar. And as a result, they're going to be answering to a question that they're not familiar with at all. So there must be an option for them to say, no, I'm not aware of this, or it's not applicable to me, or I'm not going to answer this. So there must be an option given to them. Next, use more close-ended questions. So this is quite straightforward, okay? When you're doing a quantitative research, try to avoid having too much of uh, open-ended question, which is, which is going to be a struggle for you at the end of the day to actually uh, analyze. Keep consistent scale in your ratings. So this is another common mistake that we see happening in a lot of the web survey. You will see sometimes uh, it's not consistent all across the survey, they put strongly disagree as one and then strongly agree is six. And then as you go through the survey, all of a sudden they switch the scale where one become strongly agree and six become strongly disagree. So try to be consistent in your scale. Okay, you don't want to confuse. And then of course the use of even number and odd number, whether you want a Likert scale with the odd number or whether you want an even number. There's there's good and bad in both sides. So you got to decide what is the approach that you want to use. Do you want a clear cut decision from the respondent when they answer, or do you want a middle, middle point where they have an option of to staying in the middle for a certain option? So these are some of the examples of most common uh, five point Likert scale that can be used uh, for to study frequency, to study quality intensity, you have agreement and all those other things, satisfaction, performance. So you, you are able to play with the, with the scale. And normally, whenever I do a survey, I always make sure that the smaller the number, the more negative is the response. So the bigger the number, it is more positive is the response. So, so that will allow you to visualize exactly when you look at your analysis. Logical ordering. Ensure that your survey is logically ordered. So this is important as well. The kind of question that you ask, what kind of question you want to ask first? You want to ask a general question first, a broader question first, okay? Before you go drill down to the micro question and always try to put your demographic question towards the very end because sometimes there may be some sensitive question that may put off the respondent. So it's always good to put your demographic right towards the end rather than putting it to the front. Pre-test your survey, okay? Remember, you are carrying out, carrying out this study in a crisis situation. So you have to pre-test to see whether is this question too sensitive? Is this, are you asking question that is not sensitive to the situation of the respondent in that particular crisis? So you've got to do some form of testing before you can actually use a particular survey. Consider your aud audience when sending your survey invitation okay when is the survey sent out what are the best dates to send out what kind of situation they are in if what kind of employment they are in are they able to answer in in their in their way of working so you, you got to actually understand the respondent very well before you send it out okay sometimes when you send out in mass most respond don't even bother to answer because it is sent at the wrong time of the year or wrong time of the period where they are not able to actually answer Sending reminders. So this is another important thing when you carry out uh, online survey. I'm sure you have experienced this. If you look at the chart here, okay, the dates that you see at the bottom of the chart are the reminders that is sent. 
And whenever there's a reminder send, you see there's a peak that happens. Then it drops, drops, drops. And then another reminder send, if you see the second dot here is on the 18th of September, you see another peak happening. Then it comes down. And another peak happened on the 26th. Then it, it comes down and down all the way down. So meaning to say that there is the, the, the way how you send a reminder becomes critical in, in uh, online survey. You don't need to send too frequent because if you send too frequent, people are going to just shut you off immediately. So, so you may want to send a reminder once a week. So let's say if this study is going to be open for four, for four weeks, then send a reminder once a week. And then you will see a certain peak that is happening until you see a flattening of the curve, then you know, okay, you got most of the respondent. Offering incentive is also as important. Depending on the type of survey and survey audience, offering an incentive uh, is usually very effective at improving response rate. People like the idea of getting um, something for their time, even during a crisis situation. Because there are studies that have shown that in incentives typically boost response rate by almost 50% on average. One caveat is to uh, keep the incentive appropriate in scope. Okay, uh, over, uh, overly large incentive can lead to undesirable behavior. For example, people lying about, uh, about demographic in order to not be screened out from the survey, or people are lying because they want the incentive more than actually answering the question. So what sort of incentive that you that is suitable when you are working during a crisis period because you cannot physically give them an incentive. So how are you going to deal with it? So it can be in the form of, of, of a voucher, in digital voucher, okay, uh, where there's a discount pin that is given for them to do an online purchase. All these kind of things will actually help you to improve on your, on your survey. So in short, online survey is perfect uh, for quantitative research during the period of, uh, of any crisis. So compared to any other research tools, uh, online survey serves uh, the need. But at the same time, as I've said, what is critical during, when you carry out an online survey is the sampling, okay? So what sort of sample are you going to be attracting, okay? As we are all aware the idea uh, is to draw a sample from the population and use data collected from the sample to, uh, to infer information about the entire population. So our aim is to generalize the finding as much as possible to the population of the study, even if, even if it is during the crisis uh, situation. So to conduct a statistical inference, uh, the sample must be drawn in such a fashion that uh, you can be confident that the sample is a representation of the population and it can be calculated appropriately based on the estimation, based on the estimate and their standard error. So poor sampling approach will certainly uh, become a problem when you actually carry out your analysis. So the required sample size approach is the same as your typical survey that you carry out. Okay, I'm sure you have used this. I'm sure you have looked at this before as well. You basically look at the population size, the margin of error and the, the sampling uh, uh, confidence level. So if you look at this chart itself, so the way how you manage your, your sample is important. Okay, the way how you manage your sample is important. If you want a, uh, if you want a smaller margin of error, you must have a larger sample size given the, the sample, the same population. The higher the sampling confidence level you want to have, the larger your sample size will need to be. And generally, the, the rule of thumb is that the larger the sample size, the more statistically significant it is, meaning there's less chance uh, for, for uh, there's less chance that your result is happening because of coincidence. But then if you look at this table, it is obvious that to study a certain population with the required confidence and margin of error, large sampling may not make much difference in the actual findings as long as the sampling approach is done correctly. For example, if you look of Nassau, okay, which is about 270,000. What I require is just a sample size of 384 for a 95% confidence with a 5% margin of error. Statistically, the findings of the study will not be much different even if I use more than 384 respondents. Hence, uh, in an online survey, getting the right 384 respondent uh, in this case 
is as important. In most cases, the wrong sampling approach will result in excessive sampling that is useless, time consuming, and expensive. Okay, so, so it is important for you to understand how do you manage your sampling carefully. So the so that doesn't mean that if your number of samples is very tiny, very small, the, the result is useless. The result can still be useful, okay? It can still be useful, but the kind of test that you carry out may be different, okay? You can just do a, some basic frequency analysis to even use samples that are small, because it will still show you a certain trend, a certain decision making that you can make. So it is not useless in that matter, but if you want to do a real, uh, accurate survey with, with more uh, inferential statistics, then you need to get larger number of sample size. So, as I've said, the sampling become critical. So, non-probability sampling approach is used in most, okay, not all, but in most online surveys. So, non-probability sampling is the procedure used uh, to select samples when subjects uh, in the population do not have uh, equal chance to be selected as research respondent. So, basically, there's so many ways you can do it. There's so many types. You have the convenient, I'm sure you have gone through this before, the convenient sampling, the purposive sampling, quota, snowball, dimensional. But you can also you can also do a random sampling using online. If you have a mechanism that you, pl you put in place of how your selection of the respondent is going to be in an online environment, you can still control that. So if you can do that, then it can also uh, appear as your st study is not just uh, being, is not just a, a, a non-probability sampling approach, but it can also be used as a probability sampling, but it is more, it is, it is not commonly used normally for online survey. Use of collaboration tool is also as important, okay? So we have a lot of application that is, uh, uh, that is, is there. So if you're working in a group, especially in carrying out survey, how you are going to develop the survey becomes important. There are tools for you to communicate impactfully within your team. You can create a better survey and get better results when they have input from others. So if you are working in a team, since over communication or under communication is key in good survey, using good collaborative tools will help you. Okay, you have a lot of tools now that can help you like Slack, Microsoft Team, or even Google Drive that is able to help you to uh, to work uh, in a collaborative manner in designing uh, your survey. There are also two tools to stay informed. Organizing meetings to touch base on survey feedback can be tricky uh, when everyone is working remotely, especially in a crisis situation. So instead, uh, use self-serve uh, uh, results so that you can make critical decision at exactly the right moment. Start by setting up response alert, okay? In Survey Monkey, for example, that will allow you to, to immediately look at if there's, the, there's, there's a respondent that is coming and you want, to, uh, you, you want to analyze that immediately to see whether this respondent is valid or invalid rather than waiting right towards the end. Tools to streamline your survey. Depending on the survey application that you are using, streamlining your survey to look consistent and professional is important. So you can use some standard templates that can be created for the logo images. So there are a lot of tools that can already do that. Even in, in Survey Monkey, you can do that. So this will ensure consistent survey creation across the board when you are trying to get the feedback from the people. Okay, this this last uh, last slide before last two slide before I end. So I thought I put this up for a particular reason. I find this very uh, interesting. The nurses, if you look, uh, have their own code of ethics when dealing with emergency, especially humanitarian crisis. Learning from the nurses, uh, we can use similar approach for social science uh, and even science-based uh, quantitative survey as well. If you look at the, the 10 pointers that they've put up as code of ethics, I think this is so valid when you carry out any research, okay? The researcher should ensure that he or she conducts research with compassion and respect for individual and communities. The researcher should maintain the highest sense of scientific rigor and competency. The researcher should ensure that the victims of emergency of situations welfare are not further jeopardized because of the research. This is what we've been talking to, talking from the beginning. 
the rights to privacy and confidentiality of subjects have to be respected. Number five, the researcher should not hamper relief effort, but rather facilitate. You don't want the research or survey itself to become a problematic for the respondent. Where appropriate, collaboration with other researchers and agencies should be encouraged. Okay. Research in emergency situations should be carried out only when similar data cannot be obtained. So you do not do a research for the sake of doing a research. So remember that. Research, uh, research should be responsive to the needs of the victims of the emergencies. Only research that does not hinder the hinder or obstruct effective and appropriate intervention should be carried out or else do not do the research if you do not need to do it. Research should improve intervention uh, and or local capacity to respond to the current of, of future emergency. If you look at the current research that we get uh, from the Ministry of Health on the data on, on the situation of the current state of uh, the pandemic is critical. So what kind of data that is being shown there and how do you respond towards the data? So this, this data is collected and analyzed accordingly. So these are important data that we will actually look at. So in conclusion, as a student, as a researcher, uh, remember that uh, unfortunate events is not an excuse to not carry out high quality research. Yes, the crisis uh, may disorientate you as an individual or even as a group, um, but it should not be a reason for you to not equip yourself uh, with the knowledge and skills to produce high quality research work. Quantitative research approaches uh, with high number of respondents can seem difficult to manage during crisis period. But with uh, advancement in technology today, uh, with all the tools that we have, in, especially over the last uh, few months during this crisis, we've got more tools that we are exposed to. You will be able to manage uh, these uh, targeted respondents uh, more accurately. Online survey cuts both ways when used in quantitative research method, okay? If, uh, as I've said, if, if it is designed and used badly, the desire is going to be useless. So you need to be careful how you use this data. Remember, take note of the ethical issue when carrying out studies during unfortunate events because your respondent is in a crisis situation. You need to always remember that all studies uh, carried out during crisis period must serve the needs of the researcher and also the respondents. Okay, so that basically gives you an overview of uh, what is critical uh, when you carry out uh, quantitative research uh, during any period of crisis, okay? And some of this thing that I mentioned to you is also valid not just during the period of crisis and during any research that you carry out. So take note of this, especially during a crisis period, the biggest thing that you got to always remember is the respondent. What is the state of the respondent? What is the state of mind of the respondent? If they are not in the correct state of mind, they may not be giving you the response that you expect and the response may become invalid. So it is very critical for you to always uh, understand that. All right then, so now I will open, open the... Uh, uh, session for if there's any question you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you to give your feedback or even if you want to uh, ask me any questions anybody any question we have our survey expert mr F free to you can you can you're free to Give your opinion as well, Mr. Fielding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, thank you, Dr. Vic. Um, I, I think that the point that you made about the sort of state of mind of the, of the person, I think that's quite an interesting point to take into consideration because the, the thing is, it, the, the, I think it depends upon the, the type of research that you're doing. I mean, doing, doing a piece of research at a time of crisis is obviously very helpful to see how the crisis is affecting people. But if you're trying to do a piece of what we might call ordinary research in a time of crisis, the, the, as you're indicating, the sort of mental state of the person yes. is 
obviously likely to influence how they're going to respond. Yeah. Um, and so being able to classify um, the person's mindset um, is something that you ordinarily wouldn't want to do, but may be important for you to pull out those um, responses which are, if you like, as close to some sort of normality that, yes. you, that, that, that you might want to actually be measuring. But of course, it also gives you an example, possibility of looking at the crisis on people's behavior, um, which might be, which might not have been foreseen. So for example, um, now that you mention it, my class is, is doing a, a piece of re research on corporal punishment and people's knowledge, attitudes and practices towards corporal punishment. Yeah. And of course, those practices towards corporal punishment, it may be that because people are more stressed out at the present time, as indeed they are, they might be using more corporal punishment than they would ordinarily use it. And so it may be necessary for us to put in that sort of question that you mentioned in order for us to um, get a more balanced or nuanced approach as to the use of corporal punishment because we're looking, we're doing this study at a time of particular stress. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, Devin Tuson, you raise your hand. Yes, you can unmute yourself. I've already unmuted you actually. Can you click on? Yes, okay. okay. All right. So yes. uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, Dr. Yeah. V and, and everybody else. My okay. question, um, particularly for the online survey from an ethical standpoint, um, is there any recommendation as to how we may be able to determine if the respondents, um, I guess, uh, are within that uh, ethical framework? For example, they are in the age requirement um, that we are seeking to um, survey, they're not under the age of 18 or something like that. Is there any way to determine that we are um, meeting the ethical standards, um, seeing that it's an online survey? Of course, that, that can be a challenge, but uh, in most survey, normally we will actually put that clause in the survey itself to ensure that, okay, you are within the limit, uh, within the requirement of the, study, uh, of the survey before you can actually answer the question. At the same time, you may have, uh, let's say, for instance, to look at uh, the responses. You will have a lot of uh, questions. You may have a few questions, same question appearing or reworded in a different way to basically catch uh, uh, respondents that are not ethical when they respond, especially. They may be just sitting somewhere and just answering blindly all the questions without even reading it. So you may put in a few checkpoints within the questionnaire, the same question, but it's reworded in a negatively and reworded in a positive way. And that will actually catch respondents that are not serious. But in terms of ethics, uh, uh, if you are, if, let's say if your survey is meant for those who are 18 and above, and then you have a, someone who is below 18 answering and he have actually put in false information, it's very difficult to control that. It's very difficult to control that, of course, unless uh, you, you, you ask them to put their date of birth, but even that, people can lie about it. So it is not, so, uh, it is not possible to even look at that. Uh, I don't think so. There is any other mechanism that you can do to actually control uh, uh, the age, especially. But you, you are able to control in terms of the question that you are asking by making sure that for every question, you have two questions. Uh, is for every question, there will be an identical question that is reworded in a different way. So normally, if I have a survey with 50 questions, I, may, I'm, I only need 30 questions. Out of that, 20 questions are trap questions to, for me to check whether the respondent have been consistent in their answering. So that will allow me to, to see whether this respondent uh, can uh, this response uh, can be used for my survey or not? So that is one approach that you can actually use to to check on the the eth ethics wise whether the respondents are actually answering the question uh, as accurately. Yes, could, could, could I just yes, add something yes. to, to that? Um, we we did a recent study, and what we do at the beginning is that we have the consent question, so that we have the blurb at the top to explain what the survey is about. And then we have a 
question that requires an answer that you give your informed consent and that you are over the age of 18. And unless you say yes to that question, you can't enter the survey. In, and in this particular survey, we also had another question later on about which age group did you fall into? And we actually put in a box there saying under 18. And there were a few people who did admit to being under the age of 18 when they came to that yeah. age group um, to question, even though they had previously said that they were 18 or over in order yeah. for them to enter the, 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 quest, the survey. But it wasn't a very large number of people. And so even if we didn't have that question, um, we would not have been report and um, we wouldn't have been reporting on many people whom we shouldn't have been reporting on. But because we had that extra question, we were able to eliminate those people who indicated that they were aged under 18. Yeah, yeah. Here, there's a question here. Why do we need to learn how to make a survey? I think this is important because at the end of the day, the reason why you're doing a survey is you want to, you want to get the feel of the population, okay? What is the feeling of the population on, on a certain study that you are doing on or the certain situation that you're doing? By learning how to do this survey, it is going to, because especially this online survey that we are talking about in, in the period of crisis, that will allow you to actually be more targetful in terms of the correct samples that you're going, the correct question that you are asking, and you're, you're able to analyze the findings and making sure that that finding is a good representation of the actual situation of the population. So I think carrying out uh, uh, learning how to make a good survey is important because if you do not make a good survey, as I've said, it's going to be a lot of data, which is so useless. It is not the actual feeling that you get in the ground and your, your intervention that is coming out from your survey may be not accurate. So as a result, it's going to fail the actual study that you're trying to carry out. Um, I see a comment from Miss Balance here. With an online survey, would the number of abundant attempts to uh, uh, abundant attempt be symptomatic uh, of a poor survey? Yes, sometimes uh, if you have not done a proper uh, pretest of your survey, and then when you actually carry out a real survey, and you may find some people are skipping a few questions, and consistently you may find a few questions is is being skipped or or being answered totally wrong then you know there's something wrong with the survey. The, the design of the survey was poor. You did not do a, a proper reliability analysis of the, of the indicators. Uh, that basically shows that that questionnaire may be totally invalid sometimes. If there's a huge part of the question that is being abandoned with a lot of missing value appearing, then you have a problem. Um, let me see. There's more question here. Uh, da, da, da. Who can we faculty go to receive advisement or support with data analysis of survey data that has already been collected? Is it Mr. Fielding? Mr. Fielding is here today. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I'm always, I'm, all, I'm always willing to say yes. So. <laughs> we do okay. as much as possible. I think Mr. Mr. Fielding has been really generous that he's been, he's been a star, as what Ms. Bellin said, in trying to help out. Uh, and a lot of us have actually gone to him uh, whenever we are we're actually collecting, uh, whenever we are structuring or designing the survey, then he, he helps us with the survey monkey and then gets the data out and then gives you back the, 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 the base frequency analysis. And then it's up to you to actually uh, work out more details of the survey. So normally once I get a raw data from him, I can actually transpose that into a, an SPSS and then carry out more in-depth analysis. But then uh, I think Mr. Fielding have always been there to, to assist uh, anybody that needs uh, any help. Okay, um, Ms. Balance, uh, you want to add anything? No, I would, I was, I found this to be a very uh, thoughtful uh, presentation, Vic, really and truly that um, you know, in a time of crisis like we are living in now, um, so they say the show must go on, but yes. you have to do it with yeah. a very thoughtful and sympathetic approach to yep. the people you're surveying because yep. they not, they're not themselves. Yes. 
and it's not just it's not just the quantitative survey if you even if you're doing a qualitative based research survey it's the same if you need to be doing a focus group discussion online mm -hmm. how do you how you still got to be uh, you still need to understand the, the state of the mind of the respondent as well so uh, uh, it is it is challenging because uh, to get the respondents during this period can be difficult, especially if they are already going through so much and then you want them to answer a set of questions. It's, going, it's not going to be easy. So you have to be tactful in order for you to get uh, them to respond accurately. Yeah. Tactful and sympathetic to their yes. plight. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I, think, I think that was, was apparent when... Um, Stephanie Hutchinson, I was helping her with her survey um, on stress, um, which we did a, a week or so ago. And um, that was an online study. And obviously stress, particularly in this time, is a very topical issue. And um, I was absolutely amazed at the response that we got to that. We got, in, in about 24 hours, we got a thousand people responding to that survey. Wow. Um, and I've never seen such interest in a survey in, in any of the online surveys that I've done. I mean, every time I went to Survey Monkey, you could sort of see the numbers increase as, as, you, as you watched it. Um, and, 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 what, and that was clearly, you know, a, a survey that struck a nerve with people because, you know, the, the whole issue that we're talking about really is, is stress and how that affects research. And um, the, the, I mean, the findings from, from those 1,500 people or so who entered the survey I mean, about, about nearly half of them said that they, were, they, felt, they felt more stressed now than they did in the first wave of COVID. And in yeah. the previous study that um, Dr. Hutchinson done, she'd already demonstrated that from pre-COVID time to the first wave to about Easter time or so, people had already um, become much more stressed. So the growth in stress since the beginning or prior to the pandemic is really amazing. So being aware as to the the, the um, difficult conditions under which everybody, including ourselves, because we're not free from the stress either, <laughs> particularly when yeah. there's a power cut on top. Yeah, um, yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, we're subjected we're subject to it as well, and I think we, it takes a lot of, um, you know, it, it. We have to be very careful as to looking within ourselves at ourselves as well when we are trying to engage people at the same time, because we're all under this, uh, in this sort of caught up in this, in this stress and um, how you interact with people when you're stressed and they're stressed. And particularly when you're using a survey, the words are the only way we yes. have to interact with the person. And so the words have to be chosen with the yes, utmost correct. care. And, and, and I think that that puts a greater um, yep. requirement on the careful wording of every uh, the careful use of every word that we put into the survey yeah so that's why the the role of uh, IRB becomes critical as well during this period uh, so any survey that is being carried out so normally uh, we want to make sure that IRB, it has gone through IRB uh, and IRB have actually gone through every single statement that you're using because you need to be very sensitive of the kind of words that you're using when you are asking respondents uh, who are not in a good state of mind at that, at that period of time. All right then, so that's all for the session today. Thank you so much for coming in even with your power cut. Uh, don't forget our session, uh, we have another session in fact uh, on Friday next week, September 18. Uh, tips on using Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel to analyze qualitative data. Uh, so Ms. Virginia Balance is going to be handling this session uh, on Friday next week. So please uh, register for the session. Please do come in. Even uh, if you, after you register and you're not able to make it, we will still send you the recording. Like for this session today, I, I do understand a lot of them may not be able to come in because of the power failure, but uh, we will still give them access to the recording and also the presentation today, uh, the uh, recording of the Zoom session today. All right then, so until I meet you again next week, have a good weekend, stay safe, keep your social distancing, wash your hands as often as possible and wear your mask wherever you are. All right then, take care then. Thank you so much. <laughs>